So excited for this, guys. Today, we have a special guest joining us, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar. I'm excited for this. She brings a wealth of knowledge in exercise physiology, nutrition, and holistic health. Dr. Zaldivar holds a PhD from the University of Miami, specializing in exercise physiology and nutrition as a licensed dietitian and certified personal trainer. Dr. Zaldivar is also a YouTube and Instagram creator. She serves as an inspiration for many, many people in achieving their weight loss goals through nutrition, mindset, exercise, and everything in between. Sarah, welcome to the Ketones and Coffee podcast. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for having me. Did I say your name right, Lawrence? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. That's right. Yeah, I'm excited. Lawrence. Thank you for the beautiful <laughs> intro. Let's uh, let's dive in. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I want to acknowledge just how I'm completely in awe of, you know, what you the range of topics that you cover. I mean, you really look, you really took, you know, holistic health holistic healing to a much higher level. I mean, which of course you know, speaks to your versatility in covering a wide range of topics, which I hope we can, you know, discuss, you know, have enough time to explore that today. Just excited to have you on. How are you? Where are you coming from anyways? Yeah. Where, where are you based? Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, so I'm in Ocala, Florida. And uh, to touch upon, mm -hmm. you know, what you mentioned, the wide range of topics that I talk about, mm -hmm. um, it's because everything is interrelated, right? And so for me to help my clients the way that I help myself, I had to really understand how to change everything, everything about my life, you know, and that just understanding the health aspect, but also the mindset. This is the one thing I think that is the mm -hmm. most underestimated component of success in health, in relationships, in your career. If you don't have a success mindset, you're just not going mm. to persist. You're not going to be relentless. You're not going to frame the failures as mm. the learning lessons that they are. And so I feel like I've had to really go and tackle the health aspect. I had to tackle the mindset aspect. And the um, when you tackle the mindset aspect, you realize that you probably aren't in your nine to five. <laughs> so and so I published the <laughs> quitting your nine to five, you know, guide which i finally did too i the last formal employment that i had held held on to was a teaching mm -hmm. uh position at miami Dade college i was teaching nutrition mm -hmm. there and uh, so finally quit also like two weeks ago so you know everything wow. comes together. if you're hating your job and you're hating your bosses and you're hating yeah. just the career path you chose just because you've invested in it for so long and now you feel stuck it's like i just put too much into this one path What's the point? Like, it's like, so what? Even if you did yeah. invest all this time, you, you have to invest more happiness for the rest of your life. It just makes no sense. So yeah, yeah it's it's everything related it. and the struggle. The struggle, like if I hadn't struggled mm. in all those things, I wouldn't have been able to help other people because uh, that's what I tell all my clients. Your struggle is your greatest advantage. It's like, don't be mad mm. that this is, that you have to fix this and that. Because once you overcome that, you're going to be so much more valuable to humanity and the marketplace mm -hmm. as compared to somebody who just kind of breezed through, you know, always, always was fit, always was healthy, just had to like go a few times to the gym, you know? So your struggle yeah. is, you know, you don't make mistakes, mistakes make you. Wow. I love it. I love it already. Happiness. Absolutely. I would love to touch upon that, hopefully, but uh, by at the, at the end. But I want to touch on your struggle that you talked about there. I mean, as someone who's tried and seen all the diets, it's clear that one of your deepest passion is about health and wellness, right? And weight loss and not just nutrition. And you talk about exercise and you want to, I want to get to talk about dopamine as well. So that's a big topic that I want to uh, discuss that you talked very eloquently about and how we can cure binge eating, yo-yo dieting, and cravings. Because I believe that if we cure those things, yeah. I mean, we can all lose the weight and keep that off. So we'll get to that. But first, I, let's talk about that story, the struggle that you talked about, and what led to you exploring health and wellness. Talk about that. So ever since I was like, I think... 12 i started developing an obsession with weight loss because of this like casual remark by one of my classmates He's like oh yeah because you're fat or something like that like very casual and of course i was mortified you know a little girl <laughs> and i wasn't really like that overweight but i definitely always had a few extra like 
fluff on me. I was never one of the skinny girls, you know? But that led to eating disorders because mm-hmm. once you start restricting and not knowing what to eat and not knowing how to diet yeah. and then, um, you know, seeing a dietitian at 14 and putting, she put us on the food guide pyramid where it's like the base is all carbohydrates. I started eating more carbs as opposed to less in an attempt to lose weight. And so that created binge eating disorder and that created all kinds of, um, you know, uh, mm. disordered uh, behaviors around food. And so then my weight ballooned up to like 60, 63 kilos. What is 63 kilos? And I remember my weights back when I lived in Lebanon, which is where I grew up. It's in the metrics. Yeah. Uh, you just do 63 times 2.2 and you'll get the, you'll get the weight in pounds. I, I prefer not to do math mm-hmm. in public. <laughs> so um, from there, um, I obviously to kind of figure it out and brain was like, there's no dietitian who's fat, right? <laughs> so that's why I chose to go into nutrition dietetics. <laughs> and of course, in the first, literally the first semester, um, my nutrition professor, who I adore, she's just amazing. But she was, she was very, you know, overweight. We're thinking, I was in shock. I was like, but, but how? You know, like that was the first real <laughs> kind of education that told me just knowing, um, well, also, what we were being taught is yeah. the wrong stuff, right? We were taught the wrong stuff. And mm-hmm. also, um, just even if you know, like, carnivore is great, just doesn't mean you're going to automatically lose weight, right? Uh, and we can dive into right. that. So that's that's kind of where why I did nutrition dietetics. And then eventually, you know, a PhD in exercise physiology at the University of Miami, just to kind of, because um, I, I knew I wanted to leave Lebanon. There was no, like, good future for me a very ambitious ambitious person and almost Mm -hmm. all of the other classmates of mine either like they get married and they have kids and they stay in lebanon or Mm -hmm. they get married Mm -hmm. and they have kids and they (laughs) move to Mm -hmm. like the middle east like in dubai and i just i'm a very like launch you know feminist equal rights yeah Uh, they're gonna tell me what i can and cannot wear and and so I live in Dubai, people like yeah. they're like, oh, Dubai is great. It's like, yeah, well, I, I see the signs that they put on them. Like, and like in Arabic, mm-hmm. they'll be like, you have to like wear kind of it's like F you. I would never live in a, in a <laughs> that. So that's why I had no other option but to leave. And um, and yeah, I planned it out for like two years straight. I, I, I was mm-hmm. woke as a, even though I had my master's, I was still waiting tables. There is no good jobs there. So um, every little dime I had, I put it towards, um, you know, taking all of the the tests to, I want sure, I wanted a guarantee that I was going to leave. And so I applied to multiple different, uni- all, all the four graduate schools for a PhD, I got accepted in mm-hmm. and then eventually decided, it. Was, I got accepted into like Florida State University, um, Baylor University, which actually the best program. South Dakota State University, don't ask why I fly there, <laughs> the um, mm-hmm. University of Miami. And then it was like, hmm, Baylor or UM, like, no, I'm going to Miami. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> yeah. So you got this, you got this awareness in you that uh, is so innate and mm. you are, I, I believe that you are a true practitioner because you all, you wanted to practice it yourself you're not just there just to learn these things because all of these things that you're noticing uh you're picking up things that some people may not pick up like uh you're one of your professors would be overweight but how right you're so aware of that and you wanted to you know apply what you learned to yourself and if something doesn't look right to you you know for people you know i love how i there's practitioners and there are true practitioners where they apply it to themselves, right? They're not just there to learn, but they're there to observe and really do do it themselves. And yeah. if it works, you know, great, I'll keep it, right? So I, I believe that a lot of the guests I have on the show is all are, you know, true practitioners where they came from a struggle and from that, they overcame that struggle, yeah. learned a lot about that struggle yeah. and find things that worked for them that uh, sometimes is unconventional sometimes are you know things that are viewed you know radical change right <laughs> um, you know carnivore diet you know ancestral eating all that good stuff yeah, what are, yeah, let's go that, back to eating the the one diet we ate for 99.99 yeah. percent of our existence as a species <laughs> on earth it's, yeah. Isn't it wild that we yeah. think that's radical, you know? 
Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is wild. And uh, nowadays, it's really hard to stay on a carnivore diet or keto diet without, you know, the thought of going for a cheat day. Because, you know, our environment is so, you know, the society with the society as well that, uh, you know, pushes all of these agendas like for, you know, the food, food, food industry, for the pharmaceutical industry. You know, just the sickness model that we have today, it's just so hard to stick to a diet. It's so hard to stick to, you know, you know, just keep just keeping the weight off is hard for a lot of people, right? You may lose the weight, but it's it's hard to keep it off because yeah. of, you know, cravings, because of binge eating, yo-yo yeah. dieting. I think all all of, you know, the society uh, and, and, you know, the environment that we live in, yeah. it just makes it hard for be to become healthy. Right. Because right? it's addiction, right? Because people are still, mm. you know, aren't fully absorbing the gravity of the situation of what food addiction really is, you know? Any yeah. person who's overweight or obese, it's why? Why are they overeating beyond what their physiological hunger signals are telling them? Yeah. It's addiction, right? They're not eating to really feel um, full or satisfied. They're eating to go back and feel normal again because they've destroyed their dopamine centers in their brain from a lifetime of food addiction. Yeah. And so this is the biggest, that this is what my dissertation topic was about. It was about treating the root cause of food addiction, specifically sugar addiction, utilizing the one tool that can do that, which is exercise in a very specific way. Not any exercise is going to work, right? Because if you do exercise. it the wrong way, there is such a thing as exercise addiction. That's the wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how to create an exercise program or prescription so that you can build back up your dopamine centers so that you mm -hmm. treat the root cause of addiction, which is a destruction of your dopamine centers in the brain. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter mm -hmm. that makes us feel happy, excited, productive, um, like high, you know, this is why people do mm -hmm. cocaine or Adderall, which is pharmaceutical grade cocaine, right? It's an amphetamine that raises mm -hmm. dopamine and makes you feel amazing. But mm -hmm. um, we don't want to do it in that way. We want high and we can feel high, but not in uh, yeah. not in a way that's unsustainable. So what you want to do is instead of taking a drug like cocaine or Adderall and putting it all at once, raising your dopamine and then having the destruction happen later on, because after every high, there's a low. What you want to do is front load the work and do the exercise in the right way so that you raise your baseline dopamine level. So let me explain real quick mm -hmm. how that works dopamine gets released okay. from a brain cell and it has to attach to its receptor on the cell surface of adjacent brain cells. Um, the, re the receptors for dopamine, there's a bunch of receptors. The ones that we're mostly interested in that's been studied the most within the field of addiction is the D2 receptor, right? Because we have D1, D2, D3, D4, D5. We care about the D2 mainly when it, when it comes to addiction. So with addiction, when you're taking a drug, whether it's cocaine or whether it's a cupcake, it's a drug. It destroys the D2 receptors. Mm. See, because if you're taking a drug like a cupcake or cocaine, it releases all this dopamine all at once in above the normal levels. And so your brain freaks out because it doesn't know for how long this heightened sense of stimulation is going to last for. Because it thinks, is this person going to continue taking lines of cocaine forever and be stimulated and not eat and not sleep? They're going to kill themselves. So let me protect them from themselves. Let me destroy the D2 receptors so that even if they're doing lines of coke, it doesn't matter because if they're releasing all this dopamine, it doesn't have D2 receptors for it to bind to. Because for dopamine to exert its effect, the dopamine has to bind to its D2 receptors. It's like a lock and key situation. When that binding occurs is when you feel good or high, depending how mm. much dopamine got released. So your brain is really helping you when you're in the throes of addiction whether it's to a hard drug like cocaine or sugar, which I would argue is probably even worse of a hard drug. So what it does is starts to destroy the D2 receptor. So now, even if you're having those cupcakes and those cakes, then at least you're not stimulated forever. Mm. And this is what ends up happening. You build yeah. tolerance, right? Eventually, you, your, um, 
your baseline dopamine activity, your baseline dopamine is dictated by how many D2 receptors you have. So over mm -hmm. time, you have less and less and less D2 receptors. So over time, you're not taking the drug to feel high anymore. You're just taking the drug or you're eating the carbs and the sugar just to feel normal again. Because without it, those D2 receptors, you have so little of them that it's very hard mm -hmm. to feel to activate them because you have so little D2 receptors. Even though you're releasing some dopamine, you don't have enough mm -hmm. receptors to get stimulated. So you're almost depressed most of the time. And so mm -hmm. um, if mm -hmm. you're not having the sugars or the carbs, you literally feel pressed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. You know, I can attest that sugar is worse because it's accepted and it's normalized and it's hidden in plain sight. Yeah. And we all know that you know, chronic diseases starts, you know, with consuming and and spiking your blood sugar every single day and, and which leads to insulin resistance and i want to get to talk to you about that's yeah. that's a, thank you for that explanation yeah. that in the age of onset, amazing right you know? we they hook us yeah. from when we yeah. were children so the younger the age of onset right. drug use the worse it is in terms of long-term sobriety yeah. success rates yeah and a lot of kids now from 9 to 13 are getting diagnosed uh spree diabetic Right. And which is, yeah. which is crazy to me okay. because a lot of people, yeah, they, you know, it, before you get diagnosed type two diabetic, you are, you've been insulin resistant for years. And that's what, that's what people don't understand. You know, I True. consider myself as an abstainer. Right. And I noticed that when, when I would allow myself to have a small piece, you know, this is my own mm -hmm. uh, story, especially if mm -hmm. I do it in the morning. And once yeah. I let myself have one, it always becomes a whole day of binge and the floodgates yeah. open and that one piece always leads to uh you know you you say me saying you already had one the day is somehow unsalvageable for me yeah you talked about your own struggles with addiction that you also identify within yourself i want to yeah. get to identify people to identify this within themselves how were you able to accept the fact that you have an addiction <laughs> and what did you do next um it's funny because I did my dissertation on the topic and I still was in denial. If you're just uh, okay. watching that, I was, you know, I was still doing keto and doing keto treats. I even wrote a keto dessert cookbook after I had graduated with my with my PhD working on <laughs> sugar addiction. You know, it's funny. Denial is real. Um, and I think the biggest turning point for me was when I worked on my dissertation and I had to do like the literature review, uh, and do all the research. I was able to include the research that compared sugar to cocaine and showed like sugar is four to eight times more mm -hmm. addictive than cocaine. Somehow I felt like cocaine, like, cause I knew people in my life that were very successful, functional, happy humans who will do cocaine here and there. And so I feel like my personal experience looked at that drug is like, ah, I know people who can do it. And it's like the next day at the gym, it's all good. They're not addicts. They're not, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. And, I think because of YouTube and working with clients and researching and all that stuff, eventually I came across the studies that came out later after I had already written my literature review, which is why I wasn't aware of them during my dissertation. They came out in 2017, pitting sugar against heroin. And it showed the same thing that, you know, sugar is far more addictive than heroin. And by the way, when I say sugar, I'm talking about the sweet taste, whether it's from actual sugar or artificial sweeteners, same thing. Most of the studies even right. actually use right. the artificial sweeteners because they're sweeter than sugar. So it's even worse. It's that sweet taste. When your taste buds t detect that sweet taste, it sends that dopamine signal to your yeah. brain. So I think that was a major turning point for me. It was like, wow. You know, it's like, how can you consistently have something that's more addictive than heroin and expect to be able to control your food intake? You know, I think that was a major turning point for me. Uh, be honest with me. All right. Now I said I go on an off plan meal once a week. Right. Yeah. Well, how do you distinguish a healthy relationship with food and one that may be addictive? Because, you know, I can't go longer than maybe 14 days you know i also like i i want to take my my wife out uh to din to dinner and my my daughter so i'm hitting two birds in one stone but i am having sweet stuff uh, once a week yeah how do you you're distinguish having, between a healthy relationship you, you and, already and know if you're having a, an addiction or not if you're having sweet stuff once a week but then it's not turning into mm. a week-long all-out binge yeah 
then you're not really addicted, you know? And that's, that's very, I know it's hard for people to get that, especially I've done so many <laughs> like content pieces on that sugar is more addictive than heroin. Yes, it is. It's true. But at the same time, if you remember like the Vietnam vet veterans, like um, 80 percent of the Vietnam veterans to heroin during the war, when they came back into a different environment and in a healthy, uh, happy um, environment, mm. they just stopped. They, they did they didn't all become you know like 80 percent went back to normal and only 20 percent yeah. actually stayed um heroin addicts and so it's not so much mm. about the drug it's more about your life circumstances yeah. your overall happiness in life right and this is probably why those cocaine ad not the, the people that i knew that you know would do cocaine and they just be super yeah. you know successful later on is because they yeah. weren't addicts they, they, yeah, they dabbled in a drug here and there, mm -hmm. but that was it, you know? So, yeah, I'll have some, that that? I, you know, I share what I eat on, on all of my social media and you can see like, you know, Gatorade, um, sugar-free Gatorade and stuff. Like sometimes I'll have a quest bar. It's no longer an addiction, I, you know, because I've raised my baseline dopamine level. So it mm -hmm. doesn't turn into this insatiable out of control event where it's like I had it mm -hmm. and now I just want more and it doesn't end in a day. It takes like a week or two or whatever the case may be. And it's funny because over time I noticed the addictive tendencies, they got shorter mm -hmm. in length and the intensity yeah. of whatever I was choosing got less in addiction potential. And that's really important for people to understand that, you know, it's not like sugar is the devil. And if I have sugar after two, three days of sobriety, I'll yeah. never like, that's it. I, I just have no control over it. It's like, no, it's, <laughs> it's a gradual thing because if you take yeah. a, a drug, you're taking away that dopamine stimulation that you were used to. So now you took away that dopamine. So now you're running on empty. Your brain is like very low on the yeah. amount of dopamine that it needs just to function. So you need to work mm. on raising your baseline dopamine level. And as you work to raise that event, you will naturally see the symptoms of low dopamine like addiction will get better and better and better until mm. they are completely extinguished. You know, you talk about like occasional cravings versus like deeper addictive patterns, right? Basically. Yeah, yeah. Basically, and you were still, yeah. by the way, if one day you're super tired, you haven't slept in a, you know, for whatever, your mind still have yeah. a craving here and there, even if you're working to raise your baseline dopamine, yeah. you know, but it, it'll still have, it's not like you will never, ever think of sugar ever again, you know, what I will say yeah. is don't plan. This is the worst thing for people who have food addiction tendencies. Don't plan for a chemium. Because it's like when you're planning for it and you have <laughs> a large amount, you know, it's going to be the next day is going to be hard. The day after that, actually, day two and three are probably going to be the hardest. That's because that's when the withdrawals, you're in like yeah. the throes of the withdrawals from mm -hmm. that drug use incident. So don't plan for it to as a normal part or yeah. um something that is going to help you reach your fitness goals. If you, the reason you haven't been able to reach your fitness goals is because of addiction, don't plan for more, you know, drug use. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if it happens and you're yeah. just, you know, and you need a little bit, don't also feel like it's all or nothing. And if I have a, a tiny bit, then no. I'm a failure. It's like, no, just pay attention to the trends, you know, because I yeah. used to have like, 3000 calorie binges of like the worst things imagine like that is in one yeah. meal you know like that's ha happened in years maybe a year mm. so for me that's huge maybe talk about that, that all my life has been like that you know yeah talk about that the techniques that you do because for me it's hard to not plan cuz i don't know for me when i plan my I don't call it cheat now, but I, I call it off plan meals. I don't know if that's, you know, that helps, yeah. but, uh, it, if, if you do plan for it, for me, you're, ex you're expecting to, to be, uh, you know, in a high caloric, uh, intake and yeah. there's, a li there's little, uh, guilt for me as, as compared to if it's not planned for me. Maybe because I'm an abstainer, I believe yeah. that you know if I had one, it's gonna turn to 
be uh, a day of binge. I just can't just have one. So I have to plan for mine. I don't, I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's uh, my hubby does the same thing. Like he plans his cheat meal. And it's not like yeah. he's not constantly waiting for the day. It's like he loves the stuff. It's not like he doesn't yeah. have any sort of, you know, doesn't care. No, he loves sweet stuff. But he'll plan it and he'll do it once a week yeah. and that's it. And like the next day he's back to mm. eating nothing but meat, you know. Yeah. Um, that yeah. That is a very good point because you feel you are in control. But what is addiction? It's a feeling of being out of control. Love it. So if you are in control, yeah. then you can't say that that's an addiction right because you That's are planning out yeah. a specific time where you can indulge and then and then when you do that and you only have it on the plan day and you're not breaking the word to yourself mm -hmm. then there you have it you know yeah this is why discipline yeah. is so important with addiction and this is why i don't like the um the aa you know way of doing things like i'm an you know you identify as an addict yeah. and i have no power over it it's like well if you say you have no power over it what do you think is going to happen you won't have power over yeah. it, right? So uh, I agree with that in that, yeah, like it's like it's not so much about the drug like we were saying earlier. It's more about your the way that you interact with yeah. that behavior, you know? Yeah. Kind of because you have an yeah, addiction I, I, to, to different behaviors. It's not always an internal drug, you know, like shopping addiction, mm -hmm. things like that. Does it ever get cured? If somebody is uh, addicted, can you be... Uh, can you reduce that into just like occasional cravings? Can you be, when you're, you have a past yeah. behavior of addiction, can that be, yeah. can you say that you're cured at some point? Yeah, I 1000% can say that not just in my experience personally, but even with working yeah. with clients and applying my, the brain rehab protocol yeah. that I've developed that you can see, you know, in the dopamine brain guide, um, it's the same for everybody. You know, they follow the plan mm. and they do the work and they read their baseline dopamine levels. Like, yeah, they're cured. They literally don't have, yeah. of course, it's never going to be a hundred percent. Never, ever, ever crave, you know, yeah, um, yeah. cause one day you're going to be tired. One of these days, something's going to happen yeah. that is going to kind yeah. of remind you of old patterns. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it it also depends like, okay, so what is right? Like, how do you define cure? I define it as a feeling of being just in control and feeling like mm, they're love it. just, you're in control of your food and take your yeah. in control of your health, you're in control of your feelings. Yeah. And I can definitely attest to the fact that yes, yeah. this not just with me, because I can just say it on, mm. about myself, but what if that doesn't work on other people? But when you take that program and you apply it to other people, it's still working, which, you know, obviously makes me the happiest, mm. you know? Yeah. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it that you said you're in control. That's when you know, right? You know, occasional yeah. cravings, like com comparing to addictive patterns, right? The difference is you're in control, right? Amazing. Yeah. I love that. I love that. You know, let's talk about exercise. Now, you talked about, you know, exercise how it reduces addictive behaviors. I know a lot of people who exercise just so they can eat whatever they want, right? Which is insane. But for me, right. if I would exercise, so it's, for me, it's, I would exercise. So it's harder for me to binge because I put so much effort into working out and exercising just right. to eat like crap. Can you talk about yeah. how exercise can actually reduce addictive behaviors? How, how does that work? Yeah. The reason why the base of my uh, brain rehab protocol is focused on exercise is because addiction is a destruction in your D2 receptors and a bunch of other, you know, dopamine related reactions mm -hmm. too. But let's just focus on the D2 receptors you destroy because you can, we have brain scans, right? If people are overweight or obese, they have less and less D2 receptors, similar to cocaine addicts, similar to alcoholics, similar to um, heroin addicts. It's like the same brain scans you can see in of addictions. They all have the similar um, destruction in the number of D2 receptors. So that's addiction, a destruction in D2 receptors, meaning very low baseline dopamine activity. Then, okay, the cure is let's raise D2 receptors, right? How do we do that? With mm. a very specific type of exercise. 
the exercise that you、mm. hate <laughs> to do. It is the exercise that is at the edge of your comfort. Why? Because dopamine is an anesthetic. You got to give the brain a reason to create more of that anesthetic chemical. What is the reason? It's like I'm doing something that is so painful physically, that's so uncomfortable, that it's sending the signal to the brain to adapt to this level of discomfort by raising its production of the anesthetic dopamine. And of course, endorphins and all the other stuff, but all roads lead to dopamine at the end. They all culminate in the increased production of dopamine and also D2 receptors. And so, If you're doing, let's say, a joyride, a cardio joyride, like a really fun little jog that you've already adapted to and you're having a blast doing it, that's not really uncomfortable. That's not really at the edge of your limits. That's not really going to send a strong enough message to your brain to tell it, like, I need more of the pain relieving、mm. anesthetic dopamine. So the more uncomfortable you get, the more you're going to release dopamine. And here's the thing. Let's say you start working at the edge of your discomfort to get faster with running to lift heavier weights. The more you do that, the higher your fitness level gets, the higher the D2、mm-hmm. receptors or your baseline dopamine level gets because now your brain is going to release even more dopamine and it's going to create even more D2 receptors. But if you just remain complacent, then you're going to be stuck here. And so, if let's say you,、mm-hmm. yeah, you improved your fitness level to a certain extent, but then you got complacent, then It may or may not be、yeah. enough for you. You decide. Because if you're at this level and you're, you decide you don't want to push yourself beyond this level, but you're still having cravings and you're still feeling out of control here and there, maybe it's better than what it was, but you're still not really where you want to be, then、mm. that's your sign right there that you need a higher level of fitness,、yeah. meaning a higher level of baseline dopamine、mm. level. Because they, they're one in the two. The maximum weight you can lift、yeah. at the gym and the fastest that you can run equals your baseline dopamine level. So, if you want a higher baseline dopamine level,、yeah. you have to get faster. You have to lift heavier and more、mm. and more and more and more. And I say, why cap it? No, I、yeah. just become the super breed of a human that you can be. Yeah. Why is the body doing that? I mean, just going back to、uh, historical ancestors, like, Why does the body reward us with dopamine as we get stronger? Isn't that something that's、uh, because so it wants profound, to be prepared? Because、right? if you keep hitting it with like traumatic、yeah. <laughs> physical exercise,、yeah. it's like, what is happening? This is too painful. Let me adapt. Your brain and body adapts to anything you throw at、ah, it. Like you stretch a muscle, right?、When、interesting. Body adapts and it elongates the muscle so that you're,、yeah. you have more range of motion the next time. It, it always wants to be prepared to what demands、yeah. you're placing on it. It adapts to everything you give it. That's why it wants to be prepared to keep、mm. your baseline dopamine activity elevated because it seems that every、yeah. day you're traumatizing it. And so it doesn't want to be traumatized, which is why it's like the best way not to be traumatized is to be prepared、yeah. and have more of this.、Um, Pain relieving or anesthetic chemical dopamine. Of it, the, the less、um, the pain and discomfort you're going to feel, you're going to adapt, right? And so,、mm-hmm. and, and, and again, also higher levels of serotonin, also higher、yeah. levels of beta endorphins. But I focus on dopamine because it's a chain reaction of events when you release all those chemicals. That all eventually lead to dopamine being released. All roads lead to dopamine. You know,、mm. so whether it's an addiction, whether it's、so, an exercise, you increase the baseline level of all、yeah. of the mood regulating and mood boosting neurotransmitters. You, rele- you、yeah. increase all of them, but if you look at how it happens, they all kickstart the release of one another until eventually the last thing to be released is dopamine. I want to get to the practical stuff though, because I want to talk about you know, any, any of your clients that you help, because I, without overexerting themselves, because I know there's also this factor that. If you overexert yourself, you know, people would、uh, get maybe, maybe they'll do it for a week, but then they're so, they're going to be so sore that、uh, they're traumatizing their,、yeah. their, their brain or it's so traumatizing to them. Like a diet, just, just going on a, a broccoli and chicken breast diet, you know, it's hard for people to. Uh, think about that because they got so traumatized. So, how do you gradually increase your your 
intensity. Let's say I I want to be a little bit anxious like going into the gym, but not so anxious that I won't go. Right. And you said it right there gradually, right? I'm not, you don't Mm. go from being sedentary to running at eight miles per hour. Right. We like create a plan where by every day you're as here's, here's the best way to look at it. When you start working out, if it feels super fun and it's like, ah, la, 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 that's not, yeah, yeah. It. <laughs> that's it. Now <laughs> we're not saying destroy your body in one day. Cause then it's going to take you so many days to recover that we're going to waste from, you know, getting into yeah. the habit of waking up and working out every day. So I prefer to go gradually, like you said, just a little bit. So what I do every um, for, with my training, for example, I just hit a new PR with running at eight miles per hour. So if I'll do eight miles per hour for a few days, then I'll go and I'll push myself beyond and I'll do, okay, 8.1 miles per hour for a few days or even a week, then it's 8.2 miles okay. per hour. It's okay. such a gradual increase in intensity where it doesn't take me out for a full few days where mm-hmm. I can't work out because I just you know, pushed myself so much. You could decide to do it like that, but then risk of injury goes up. And if, I mean, an injury can really take you out for months, you know? So that's why it's not recommended. So where did you you start though with running? I just want to have a perspective here. When you started running, can you go back to that time? What, what, what was your time? back then and what was your I how really many miles was a runner run? from I I remember I definitely have the genes for it I remember even without any training whatsoever I would always win like the track races um without any training yeah. so definitely mm-hmm. I do have like those I actually did the 23 and me gene test and it does confirm that I do have more of that I'm like kind of built for a runner um yeah so I've always um in my 20s or say no I wouldn't say I would run that much cuz I I didn't really become super consistent with running until I bought my first treadmill, I would say. And so that was in my Uh. 20s, um, late 20s. Um, For me to remember, know that I didn't really push myself the Mm. way I push myself right now. I was kind of like just um, Mm. more of a joyride. You know, let's go for a jog. Like that was training. But it's helpful still because it makes me very comfortable feeling um, Mm. like you know, sweating. I've had clients like our lives and that was a major yeah. roadblock. It's like it provides a major resistance. Um, and then, mm-hmm. yeah, I would, I remember mine of mine because she hadn't, she hadn't really had this level of exercise. Uh, and I'm not saying that I was like a, a star athlete or anything, but I definitely had a lot more um, experience with movement starting from when I was a teenager. Um, and so for me, it kind of comes easier because i started sooner and i remember thinking that for her in her 30s mid 30s she would literally break down crying when i would explain to her how important it is for us to push her fitness level and the biggest biggest breakthrough we got after months of coaching was three jogging sessions in one week it was 30 minutes each and it was like a very light jog you know and it, it was very hard for her to develop the habit it was she just uh would would feel so uncomfortable sweating you know so the i and i remember thinking wow like i must have gone through that but not really realized it it's just because i've been doing it for so long it's just i enjoy it now anything you do you keep repeating it becomes easier but yeah for for some people it can be a little traumatic um you might you're gonna feel lightheaded you're gonna feel uh, very weird you're gonna feel nauseous when you really start straight way and pushing yourself this does not mean there is something wrong with you this is normal to everybody, you know, those feelings, you mm. are going to feel them. And, you know, I'm not saying completely disregard any safety measures. I'm just saying that if you don't understand that it's happened yeah. to all of us, the nausea, the lightheadedness, yeah. the feeling sick, the feeling, you know, then, you know, it, it's very common and it's just your body and brain adapting yeah. to this level of comfort and eventually it goes away i don't feel that way anymore yeah no absolutely and running eight miles in an hour that must have you must have done it 
gradually, oh, right? That's important. Uh, with with that anything that, that we means, do. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying I'm running eight miles. That's a good point. I'm not doing eight yeah. miles per hour nonstop for a whole hour. I'm resting and yeah. starting again and resting yeah. and starting again to yeah. try and get like a mile or a mile and a half continuous. Yeah. But yeah. I can definitely do um, seven miles per hour for like a mile straight before I walk a little bit for like a couple minutes and then. Um, so yeah, mm. like that's another way that you can push, you know, here's what I recommend. Just like you go and you lift weights and you start with warm up sets, you do a lighter weight and then a slightly heavier weight and then a slightly heavier weight until you hit your working set, which is the heaviest weight you can possibly lift. I recommend doing the same thing with running. Start with a light jog and then, and then walk a little bit and recover. Then do another light jog, but that's a little bit faster and then walk a little bit. And then those are kind of like some warm up sets. And then you start increasing the intensity more and then you walk. And then those last two or three sets, what you're doing is like sprints for like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 mm. miles. And then you walk and then sprinting. When you, tr when you do it that way, you are working your um, kind of like endurance level and you're also yeah. super fast part of your yeah. training you know so you're really you're really pushing yourself to the limit at the end of every workout you really are knowing what your limits are and that is so motivating because now i can say i'm hitting eight miles per hour next week i'll be able to hit 8.1 8.2 miles per hour mm -hmm. in a month or so i'll be at nine miles per hour and that i know that that's the edge of my physical ability mm. and that equals my baseline dopamine level so it's yeah. just seeing that understand what's happening to my brain you will start noticing also the feelings you get the mood that you're in the way you interact in life the amount of focus you have the amount of discipline your discipline becomes so much easier when your baseline dopamine level is elevated mm. because well, every time you deploy discipline, you're using up some of your stores of the dopamine pool in your brain. So if you have a higher baseline dopamine level, you have a lot more dopamine stores in your brain. When you are actually deploying discipline and you're using up some of that dopamine, it's not really, you, you can barely feel the difference in the dopamine. It's not really dropping so much because you deploy discipline. So you're not going to feel the resistance and the emotional pain that people associate with discipline, which is why they don't like to deploy it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So running or cardio is not so much for weight loss, right? Like it's it's much more about releasing dopamine and reducing mental, addictive patterns, yeah. right? Mental strength. It's it's, it's about discipline and mental yeah. strength, um, because that's really what fitness and health is about. It's like we all know, cake is bad. <laughs> Protein is good. Yeah, yeah. Like at the very basic level, we all kind of all know what we need to do. It's not so. It's not a really a knowledge problem, right? It's more of a emotional pain problem. Yeah. The moment you tr you do what mm -hmm. you're supposed to do, you're just not feeling good. Yeah. Almost depressed in some days. You know, yeah. to the point where it's like, yeah. f it, I'm just gonna eat whatever, and I'll st and then you and then you still like make up excuses in your mind why yeah. it's okay this time and why you'll have a better plan next time. But then the next plan happens and you're still feeling the same emotional pain when it when when it really comes down to it, you know? This is why like the first week or two on a diet is, is like fantastic. You're so motivated. You're proud of yourself for taking a yes. step. But then that's when really the cravings hit. So, yeah. You know, I, I don't claim to be, you know, a weightlifter. But uh, if I go two days or more without working out, I, I look I look for it. I get depressed. You talked about like just yeah. uh, addiction with uh, working out or exercising talk about that a little bit uh, i'm curious to learn about how you can be addicted with you know over over working out yourself oh like how do you get addicted to exercise there's so many yeah, yeah exercise. right that's the question right yeah yeah so there's so many um people that you can look up i mean you can just go and you can see uh, so many uh like documentaries done on those topics especially exercise addiction where people get 
um, hooked on the high you get from running. It's usually long distance. It's a cardio uh, joy, right? This is why I say it's the, the, the base of my protocol is the complete opposite of what people think of when they're thinking cardio. They're thinking, oh, just a, a light jog. And then if you do a light jog enough times, you start to realize some, at some points you get this high from it, this release from the beta endorphins where it feels good. So people can, can get hooked on that where they're running for eight, my, for eight hours in a day and doing multiple um, fun cardio sessions. That the problem with that is that you can start getting hooked to the endorphins that are being released. But the problem is that the recovery that it's going to require from those exercise sessions is hard for you to allow your body mm, to recover because it. you're yeah. hooked on that feeling. So you keep going back and you keep going back and you can't really sit still for a few days to allow your body full recovery. And that's where it can become mm -hmm. a problem. And it's basically you're doing the cardio in a way. What you what you're doing is you're prev you're avoiding the uncomfortable feeling that I am telling you you should seek out when you're sprinting, when you're when you're working out at the edge of your limit. It's you really only want to count the reps that hurt, whether it's the strength training or whether it's the running. The only the only ones that matter are the ones that hurt because those are the only that's that feeling of discomfort is the only thing that's going to send the signal to the brain to create more dopamine mm. and more endorphins and more of those baseline level of yeah. those neurotransmitters so that your baseline goes up so that from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep you're high you're feeling great i love that i love so every time i'm uncomfortable with a workout i'm gonna be thinking about this that i'm releasing dopamine yeah. and you know less depressive moments yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're 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 upregulating your baseline. How motivating is that? Mm. So, and the only way you can upregulate mm. your baseline is through through how much discomfort you can handle. And so, this is why I only count the reps that hurt, mm -hmm. whether it's mm. with strength training or whether it's running. The, the only thing that matters is the amount of time you spend feeling uncomfortable. That's it. Other than that, it's useless. Mm. Might as well just relax, yeah. lie to yourself yeah. that you're. you're <laughs> That's masterful. If you master that, you'll be superhuman in a couple of years, right? I mean, I if you just breathe. right, super breathe metabolism. <laughs> yeah, and I have another right. diet. I should I talk should about it. Launch it really soon. So super breed mindset. I, I love that notion of being a super breed. Nice. Because you have the ability to do nice. that. Yeah. Absolutely. Where can people find you? Where can people find that those links? Tell us about it. Yeah. So you can just go. I don't know if my name is going to show on the YouTube um, you know, thing that we're doing. Um, it's uh, Dr. Saldivar, um, Sarah with an Aldivar, um, Z-A-L-D-I-V-A-R. So my website dot com has all the guides actually go to drsarasoldivar.com forward slash shop and you will see all of the guides that i have the dopamine body which is the weight loss guide the dopamine brain the dopamine brain is everything we're talking about today it's the brain rehab protocol that i developed that is based off of my dissertation at, you know that i worked on at the university of miami how to boost your baseline level of dopamine um, you know, I have a monster mindset guide. You hear how important mindset is. Um, the 100K social media guide where I break down you know, everything I did to quit all the jobs and become my own boss, making six figures and how you can do the same because that might be the reason why you're having, you know, addictive tendencies. If you're just yeah, hating yeah. the career path you're in, you feel stuck. So, yeah. And then, of course, you know, Instagram, Dr. Dot sarah.zaldivar and youtube my name and it's easy to find me awesome dr sarah thank you so much for coming on sharing your story with us here today and talking about just amazing topics here that uh you know frankly i would love to practice myself and you know who doesn't want less depressive moments right and i feel you know it this is a sign for everybody to just get on that treadmill or get outside and get uncomfortable right and whenever you get uncomfortable it's so true you know, i wanted you know to show you my treadmill but i have too many things on it right now <laughs> <laughs> yes awesome exactly it's like you know who doesn't want to feel like you can do anything you set your mind on? yeah 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 and, and and that idea that just get uncomfortable and you 
release those dopamines to become a superhuman yourself, super breed. You know, that's an idea that I want to, you know, one day, you know, be part, be a part of. So thank you for sharing these topics with us. Uh, such uh, interesting topics here. I would re-listen to this if you guys take notes, you know, uh, get on uh, the description down below. Check out Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, her links and uh, her courses. And uh, make sure that uh, you also subscribe to her YouTube channel, Instagram, follow her on Instagram. And get most of uh, all of these topics that she talks about very eloquently on her social. So thank you again, Dr. Sarah, for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. I had a fantastic time, you know, talk, uh, getting to know you and, you know, chatting. And hopefully we'll do this again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Dr. Sarah, bye-bye.